Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I teach at the University of Ottawa and also at Carleton University. In this video, I'm going to talk about the science of superstorms, like Harvey, and also I'm going to talk about what's next. You know, where, where are we going from here? So by any means of measurement, Harvey was a massive superstorm. The precipitation or rainfall from Harvey was 20 trillion gallons. To give you an idea, that's about three times that from, from Sandy, Hurricane Sandy. Moody's Analytics has come up with a number, an estimate of $125 billion for the storm. AccuWeather has come up with a number of about $190 billion. That would be insured losses, uninsured losses, the effects on the economy, jobs lost, and all of the, the trickle or, or the cascading into various economic issues, you know, food destroyed, farms destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. Eighty percent of Texans apparently don't have any flood insurance. The rainfall uh, in the most, uh, the place that got the most rainfall, it was uh, 51.88 inches, which sets a record for the continental U.S. That was over five days. There were three landfalls of the storm, 185,000 homes destroyed, damaged and destroyed. 17% of the U.S. refineries production was, 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 um, went offline. Now, as bad as this storm is, which was getting all of the coverage, there's also massive storms and flooding in other, many other parts of the world, including India, Nepal, Bangladesh, for example. Bangladesh, three quarters of the country is presently flooded out. So why are these things happening? Why is our atmosphere different? How is it? It seems to be turbocharged. It seems like the hydrological cycles are completely different. In a nutshell, they are. So the Earth is basically a heat engine. The equators are warm, the poles are cold, heat gets transferred from the equators to the poles. About two-thirds of the heat in the atmosphere, um, setting up things like the jet streams, and about one-third of the heat in the ocean currents, which of course are moving much slower, but carrying you know a, lot, a, a heck of a lot of heat. So because we're losing Arctic sea ice, and snow cover in the spring in the Arctic exponentially, the Arctic is getting a lot darker. Therefore, it's absorbing a lot more sunlight. Therefore, you know, it's heating up a lot more. In fact, the rate of rise of temperature in the high Arctic is somewhere like five to eight times faster than anywhere else on the planet. So because the Arctic is heating, the temperature difference to the equator is less Therefore, the jet streams are slowing down and becoming much wavier, and therefore we're having far more extreme weather events on the planet. The frequency of occurrence, the severity, and the duration of these extreme weather events is ramping up significantly. Whether the extreme weather events be torrential rains leading to flooding or droughts. Okay, so this is the bottom line. Did climate change cause the hurricane? Okay, that's the wrong question to ask. We're undergoing abrupt climate change. We've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere and oceans. Therefore, all weather events that are occurring are, are happening in this different climate. So the statistics of weather have changed. The severity of events, where they occur, when they occur, the type of events. This is all changed because we've turbocharged the climate. For every degree Celsius in warming, there's, okay, so let me talk about the specific things that are key in the science. What is different now from before? Why are these storms getting, getting out of hand? Okay, the first thing is sea surface temperature. Okay, the temperature of the ocean water on the surface, it has to be greater than 26.5 degrees Celsius, which is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, in order to have enough evaporation and enough energy to trigger tropical disturbances 
And when these disturbances move over warm water, they, get, they suck energy out of the ocean and they become upgraded into hurricanes. As they proceed across warm water, they move up in the scale and can become, you know, go up to different categories of hurricanes. As long as there's no shear winds to break apart the storms, then these storms can develop into massive storms. So the sea surface temperature in the Gulf of Mexico, which is where, where uh, Harvey, where the tropical disturbance first started, uh, is at least a few degrees Celsius warmer than normal. It's pushing 30 degrees, 31 degrees, 32 degrees Celsius. It's like a sauna. It's an ideal temperature to breed these storms. As the hurricane moves across this warm water, normally what happens is the energy is sucked from the surface and there's upwelling of colder water to displace the evaporated water and the warmer water. And there's a lot of churning in the ocean and that cools the temperature at the surface after the hurricane passes. Or if the hurricane is moving very, very slowly, it can kind of self extinguish itself or at least not gain in strength. But the problem is, is in the Gulf of Mexico, the water is very, very warm deeper down. So it's not just the sea surface temperature that's important, it's the water below the surface that is very warm. So as Harvey was moving across, it could gain strength, but the temperature of the surface water in the wake of Harvey was still very, very strong. So this is a key factor, okay? The oceans are absorbing about 93% of the heat. You know, we're as humans living on the land, we're experiencing the air temperatures and the surface temperatures on, in, on, on land. And what, it, what we don't realize is, or what a lot of people don't realize is, is that about 93% of the heating is going into the oceans, raising these sea surface temperatures. Okay, the air temperature is also much warmer. So the greenhouse gases, like I said, we've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere with our anthropogenic or human caused emissions. The warming since the uh, turn of the century, previous century, is over a degree Celsius now. Or, one, um, okay, it's over a degree Celsius, warmer than normal, okay? Um, we're having, we're setting records each year in terms of warmth, okay? During the El Nino year, um, last year we had record high temperatures because a lot of heat was coming out of the oceans. Okay, so there's a simple basic physical relation that when the air is warmer, it can hold more water vapor. Also, when the sea surface temperature is warmer, there's more evaporation. And when there's more evaporation, that water vapor will get into the air and because it's hotter than the surrounding air, it's buoyant, it will rise up, you'll get convective lift, and the water vapor will condense into clouds, into water droplets and clouds, and that energy is released to fuel these massive storms. So for every degree Celsius increase in warming, there's about 7% more water vapor in the atmosphere. So this water vapor turbocharges the storms and it's why the extreme weather events that we're seeing around the planet seem to be a lot more intense than they, they used to be. Now, another key factor, so those two things, sea surface temperature and air temperature are both increasing at, and as a direct result of climate change slash global warming. Now, the other key factor is the storm guidance is changing. The jet streams which circle the earth, they normally pull storms along, they guide storms. But the, the, because of the warming that's going on, the jet streams were pushed further north than they would normally be. So they were not there to pull Harvey away from the coast once Harvey went ashore. So the problem is, is Harvey stalled out because of these jet streams and just circled around and meandered and stayed in place day after day after day, depositing huge amounts of water. Parts of Harvey were over the land, parts of Harvey were over the ocean, the parts over the ocean were gaining strength. So the strength of Harvey was maintained when it was ashore, 
because it was basically sucking energy, heat energy from the ocean. It acted as a fire hydrant or a conduit directly from the surface of the ocean, if you like, over to the land, over the land of Texas near, near Houston. Um, you'll, rec you'll remember maybe that when Hurricane Sandy came ashore in New York, it was a complete surprise because it did a complete left turn. Again, it couldn't move north, it couldn't move east because of blocking from the jet stream configuration, so it had to move ashore. So the guidance of these storms is different. Another factor is the brown ocean effect, if you like. When the ground is saturated with water, in other words, the, the soil pores are completely filled with water, there's no air, there can be no more water absorbed into the ground, so it's all runoff or pooled. So when the water is pooled, as the storm proceeded, as Harvey proceeded to dump water and cause massive flooding, now instead of the hurricane seeing normal land and dissipating in strength, it saw water on top of the land. It would suck up that water vapor from the evaporation of the water over the land and maintain its strength. So call it the brown ocean effect. Sea level rise, of course, is, is happening uh, because the, mostly because of the rising temperature of the water and warm water expands. So because of the extremely high sea surface temperatures, in, and, and, and water temperatures deep down in the Gulf, they expand. So that raises the local sea level in the Gulf. Add that to the global sea level rise, about 3.5 millimeters per year on average right now, and that's rapidly accelerating. Then when you get a storm surge as from Harvey on top of this, and then a high tide and so on, all of these things add up and you get more flooding. The, the risk from hurricanes is much greater. Now, this was more of a case for Sandy and less of a case for Harvey because Harvey, um, most of the damage from, from Harvey was from the direct water, the direct precipitation. There's also dead zones. You know, what's going to happen? I mean, that water that is on land can, can cause a temporary dip or stalling of the global sea level rise because you're transferring huge amounts of water from the ocean to land. We saw this a few years ago when there was huge rainfall over Australia and parts of Asia and the sea level rise had a temporary stalling and drop and then it accelerated at an even higher rate afterwards sort of to make up for that. Um, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico was the largest it's been um, in a long time this year in 2017, it's caused by industrial and farming runoff. So imagine all that water sitting on the land in Texas, carrying chemical chemicals, carrying pesticides, carrying fertilizer, nutrients, etc. It's going to run off into the Gulf, has to go there, and the dead zone next year, you know, watch out, it could be phenomenal. Another thing about Houston is, you know, in the media you'll see there was a 1 in 500 event two years ago, in flooding event, a 1 in 500 year event last year, and now a 1 in 1,000 year event. Okay, those numbers are statistics, sort of return intervals of these storms. They, they show how rare it is, okay, but the climate system has changed, so those statistics are no longer valid. Obviously, you know, what used to be a one in a thousand year event in the old climate, perhaps it's a one in 30 year event now. You know, as we get further warming, perhaps it'll be a one in five year event. Eventually, you know, if it's so frequent, then it means that recovery from one event to the next is basically impossible. So we've lost our climate stability. Weather extremes are increasing in frequency, severity, and duration. It's going to affect global food supply very soon. We're in an age of consequences. Okay, the appeasement of the governments and politicians is not acceptable. Lip service is not acceptable. Fossil fuel subsidies of $5 trillion a year by governments of the world must be removed. Otherwise, you know, we're in a world of hurt. Thank you.